So uh, we were talking about inverse functions, uh, and that's what we're talking about today still. Hello? Okay. I think you can hear me. So, thank you, Dustin. <clears throat> so, um, so what happens to the graph of the, what does the graph of the inverse of a function look like? So, um, what does y equals f inverse of x look like? Well, it's um, it's pretty simple, actually. So, for example, this graph goes through the point to negative 0 0.5. That means that f of 2 is negative 0 0.5. The way, that's what the graph means. If f of 2 is negative 0 0.5, that tells me something about the inverse. I do whatever to 2, I get negative 0 0.5. That means that if I undo the same thing, to negative 0 0.5, I get 2. So that means that the graph is going to go through uh, negative 0 0.5, 2. Um, and that's the case for for every for every point on the on, on the graph. Here, the graph goes through, say, 2.51. That means that f of 2.5 is going to be 1. So f inverse of 1 is going to be 2.5. Um, so the graph of the inverse is going to go through 1, 2.5. So you, you switch the x and y coordinates at, uh, at every point. Um, let's do one more point. So here, say we're going through 0, negative 2. The inverse is going to go through negative 2, 0. And what happens, so, if the, if, um, if the graph goes through x, y, the inverse goes through y, x. So what happens, um, what happens to a picture if you interchange the x and y coordinates? Um, I'm going to tell you, because I feel like if you know, it's because you've read the book. Um, what happens is that you take the this diagonal line, 
which is the line y equals x, is the, the one that makes a 45 degree angle with the axis, and you and you mirror across this line. And that's it. So, um, That's it. Other, does that make sense? Other questions? of the square. So, um, so what is the inverse? And what is the problem? Matthew, yeah, uh, the inverse is the square root. Um, so, so that's the answer to one of the questions. What is the problem with this? What is the problem with me asking you what is the number whose square is for? They are not opposites. I mean, Matthew says they are not opposites. I think, I'm not sure what that means. Do you mean that you get two opposite roots? I... Oh, graphical wise, the way they look. You know what? Let's. Uh, um, that was my plan anyway. So here's x squared, and here is root of x. So um, and here's the mirror. So, you're right, um, that the, the, the red graph and the, and the blue graph, they don't look like, um, like one is the mirror of the other. It looks like it looks like the the blue part is the mirror of of just the right side of the parabola, and that, that's exactly what it is. So. So someone tell me. Why, why is the graph of this just half the parabola, not, not the whole parabola? Isn't it because one, you can't have a negative square root and so it kind of like just restricts the domain and takes the positive side? We, we did, okay, I mean, yeah. Um, so we only, we only took the, um, so we only took the, the positive square roots because when you, oh, uh, all this is closer. Um, right. um, I think, 
think. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I think you can. Um, okay. So. I'm gonna change plans, open the graph in here. So, um, Chrome Pros. Oh, but maybe I can kill. Or well, maybe I can't. So, I'm gonna change devices. So, x squared, root of x. So, So the thing is, we're we're only taking the positive square roots. Of course, we could take the negative square roots, but Isaiah said, um, Isaiah said that you know when we if we say we're taking the positive square root, we never get a negative number. So why do we do this? Um, why is this whole blue thing not the inverse? Uh, so the blue thing is not the inverse because the blue thing is not the graph of a function. This is not the graph of a function. Because if I ask you what is what is f of four, you go, well, I'm gonna look for the point with x coordinate equal to four, and then you find two points, and then you don't know if the answer is two or negative two. And and that's a problem because a function should only give uh, one number. This graph doesn't pass a vertical line test, so it cannot be the graph of a function. So, also, I mean, if I ask you what the square root of four is, um, if you answer two, I might say, no, the other one. That means that there's um, two answers to that question. And for it to be a function, it should only, there should only be one. So, for this reason, what we do is, instead of asking, Instead of what is the number whose square is um, four, that would that would be this would be a famous of four. What we ask is what is the number what 
What is the positive number? Who square is four? So if, if I ask this question, I'm very sad because I have two answers. This is not a function. But if I ask this other question, the answer I get is just two. And I do get a function. OK. So this idea of um, making the domain smaller is what we use for trigonometric functions. Um, we can force a function to be one to one because remember that a function has to be one to one in order to have an inverse. Like for example, the, the function in problem three of the homework. So, um, so let's talk about inverse trig functions. So, um, what is the inverse of sine? Um, well, we let's let's graph it. So this is the graph of sine. I know this one. All right, that's great. You should feel good about it. So this is uh, the graph of sine, uh, and and to I mean, to get it, its inverse is going to have to be its reflection, and to do its reflection, I'm just going to interchange the x and the y. So, um, so now we run into problems. This uh, this this curve doesn't pass a vertical line test. This is not a function. If, if I take, well, I mean, if I take an x-coordinate here, it does pass because it crosses nowhere. But if I, but it has to pass it for every single line I can think of. And if I draw this vertical line, well, it crosses, I don't know how many times, like six in this screen. Uh, and if you go and it crosses the, the graph infinitely many times, and it's supposed to be just one time, and infinitely many, is more than one, and that's really bad. So um, it's not even close. So what do we do? You probably know how this goes. Um, I go instead of looking at the at the whole thing, I'm gonna just take a little piece and ignore the rest. So. What if instead of taking this whole uh, line, I take this? This is a this is a graph. Um, it passes a vertical line test, as you can see. So instead of uh, take looking at this whole graph, look at um, the graph I, I was just telling you about. But let's see if I can pull this off. Make um, uh, maybe pi over two smaller than y pi over two. It's really smaller than or equal, but um, in a graph you can't tell the difference. So now, if I only look at the at the part I just drew, this is this is a graph of a function now. 
uh, look at the vertical line says. Every vertical line crosses uh, either once or zero times. Even here, there's just one crossing. My trick professor could never, never what? Could never arch sign. Um, so what we have done, oh, sorry to hear that. What uh, we have done is, is just, we have this whole thing that we don't like, just take a little piece of it. We've made the, well, we, we've changed, we've let ourselves choose less X coordinates. Um, and if we look at the reflection, that's the same as saying, I chose fewer X coordinates. I over two, it's more than X, it's more than five over two. So instead of taking the inverse of sine, which is a function that doesn't have an inverse because it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Look at this horizontal line, it crosses the red graph twice. I mean, infinitely many times. I just look at this tiny little piece uh, and and then the red one is, is the piece of sign that I care about and the blue one is the, the inverse that now does exist. So the secret to finding the inverse of sine is taking the, the inverse of a smaller piece of sine where the domain is restricted. Um, and that's all there is to it. And we call, um, and this blue thing we call arc sine. Let me write that down. So, So sine is not one to one, so it can't have an inverse. So um, where the bang go? Um, for example, let me show you that it's not one to one. I mean, we saw in the in the graph, but the sine of zero is zero sine of two pi is also zero, sine of pi is zero, sine of negative five pi is zero. Um, every time I add two pi to an angle, I get the same sign. So that's a lot of different, a lot of different X's that give me the same value. That's the definition of not being one to one. So to fix this, we look at the function, um, which I mean is equal to sine. Only uh, we still mean. Well, what is so the piece that I chose there uh, was x negative pi over two smaller than x smaller than pi over two. Um, if you look at sine at the graph, here's pi over two. Here, uh, pi over two is the first, um, I forgot the word for the top of the wave. Uh, the first time it hits the, the highest point and negative pi over two is the first time on the left where it hits the lowest point. So I'm just looking at this and arc sign is defined to be the inverse of this function. So the inverse of sine would be answering the question, what is the angle that has this sign that I'm giving you? What is the angle that has sine one half? But that 
the question has many answers because as soon as I have one answer, I can add 360 degrees to it to get the same answer. So instead, the question I'm asking, which is what I just wrote here, is what is the angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 between negative 90 degrees and 90 degrees that has this sign? So um, if I... So what are the important values of sine, of arc sine? Well, so here's the important values of, I mean, important, the ones I can name. There's 30 degrees, there's 45 degrees, there's 60 degrees, there's 90 degrees, and the the signs are root one, root two, root three, root four, over two. This is zero, this is one, this is one half. So, um, and well, I should, and then there's also the negative ones. Sine is an odd function, so changing the sign of x changes the sign of the answer. The changing the s i n g s i g n of the of the question changes the s i g n of the s i n e. <clears throat> Sine of negative x is negative sine of x. So these are the angles between uh, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So now, if I ask you the question, what is the angle that has sine 0? which is the, the meaning of arc sine. If you give me an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, I go, which is the angle that has sine 0? Well, here's sine equal to 0. So this is the angle. Now, if I ask you, what is the angle that has sine 1 half? You go, well, this angle has sine 1 half. Uh, and you can see where this goes. What angle has uh, sine root 2 over 2, <clears throat> it's pi over 4. So the arc sine of root 2 over 2 is pi over 4. I'm just switching the input column with the output column. And I'm not going to write the whole thing. I'm bored. So, so if you know how to compute sines, you probably know how to compute arc sines. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? So, um, so our cosine. So, what I could do, what I won't, because it would be very boring, is um, go through the same whole thing again. So cosine is, I mean, it looks like a wave. It looks like the same wave, except moved around. Uh, so we restrict its domain and cosine. So I know there's a lot of memory, a lot of stuff to memorize and trick, but if you're careful with what you memorize, there's really not a lot. Just remember a few things and then you can get everything else from there. One thing I 
one thing I remember uh, is that cosine of zero is one and then cosine goes down. So, and I know it repeats every two pi. And well, I know it's even, but I could, it's a wave. So I know just from knowing that it starts at one, I can guess that it's even. So since it repeats every two pi, this has to be the halfway point. This has to be pi. So um, again, just like sine, this function does not pass the horizontal line test. It's not one to one. Uh, so what do I do to make it pass the horizontal line test? I pick a little piece and it has the same shape as the piece of sine that I was picking. And now I take, it's a different interval because if I take the same one as I was doing before, that's not gonna work. If I take the same one, it's not gonna pass the, the horizontal line test. So I need to take X between zero and pi or I could make another choice. So this is arbitrary. This is just something everyone agrees on, but you could define arc sign to be the problem in your homework where the domain is three pi over two, five pi over two. It's just that no one would know what you're doing because no one calls that arc sign. Uh, and then a function that we call arc cosine. It's called arc because how much angle is the same as asking how long is the arc. So the arc cosine is the arc that has the cosine whatever, the arc cosine of x is the arc that has cosine x is the inverse. of cosine with um, the domain restricted to the interval zero pi. Uh, so that's it, it's just, it's just the same as sine. Um, So notice that I'm writing arc sine, and you may have seen, and the books does it, and I hate it for it. Um, if you see sine inverse, if you see this, this could mean arc sine or one over sine, and these are definitely not the same. You, I mean, I don't know what it means to divide by sine. If it means, I mean, you divide by sine of a number, you need to divide by a number. But doing the inverse function, like I said yesterday, is definitely not dividing. But if you see, I mean, if you see this, well, like you, you have to get some common. Yeah. Isn't it one over sine also cosecant, right? Um, right, yeah, one over sine, one over sine of x is a function that we call cosecant of x, yeah. So, yeah, I guess people won't write sine inverse to mean cosecant, but I just avoid writing sine inverse. I, I just never ever write it. Uh, I just write arc sine if I mean the inverse of sine, uh, and I write one divided by sine if I mean cosecant. And I don't feel like I, honestly, like, cosecant, it's there, but then I have to remember which one it is, and I could just be writing one over sine. So I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna take points off if you read sine, in, if you write sine inverse. Um, but I think you shouldn't write it, because the thing is, if you write it, you're gonna get confused, and then you're gonna make mistakes, and that's gonna be a problem. But if you look at a calculator, if you live in the 20th century and you and you still have calculators, uh, the bottom that computes the arc sign is called sine inverse. Uh, finally, the arc tangent. Is um, the arc tangent is way better. I don't know. 
Maybe not way better. But yeah, it's just optimistic. So let me show you what tangent is because I might um, I might not do a great picture. So the tangent uh, sine over cosine, remember, it repeats over, well, sine and cosine repeat every two pi, but it turns out that tangent repeats just every pi. And again, this is a function that doesn't, is not one-to-one -one at all, doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Now for any horizontal, horizontal line you draw, you you don't get um, you you get infinitely many crossings, which is bad. So, um, but now I mean, looking at the picture, I think it's pretty clear what you want to do. You want to just take one of these, take just one of, of these um, pieces. I mean, it almost. It almost looks like the graph of a lot of functions put together. So what is this piece? What is this point where the tangent um, does a weird thing? It's pi over two. It's the point where cosine becomes zero. So if instead of taking the whole tangent, you take just the black part, um, that is a, a function that is one to one. There's only one angle between negative pi over two and pi over two for every value of the tangent. And if you take the inverse, I wonder what happens here if I write tan inverse. It understands it, doesn't think it's a one over tangent. Um, you have a function that we call log tangent. So, What we do is we restrict to negative pi over two, now strictly smaller than x, because um, 10 over pi over two, so 10 of pi over two is sine of pi over two divided by cosine pi over two. And this is one divided by zero, and this is very bad. This is not makes sense. Ninety degrees doesn't have a tangent. So if we restrict to this domain, the inverse is called an arc tangent. So, um, so that's it. Uh, so there are six strict functions, right? There's also secant, cosecant, and cotangent, but no one, I've, I've never ever heard anyone call the inverses of those functions by name. Just if you really needed them, you would say, uh, you, I mean, you could talk about arc cosecant, everyone would know what you mean, but, why would you? Why why add names that we don't need? Arctangent on arc sine are useful. Um, arc secant is not useful. Um, so I mean, if you really want to. Uh, Here's something you can do. The arc secant of x is the uh, is the arc cosine of one over x. So instead of um, instead of talking about arc secant, why not just talk about the arc cosine of one over x and Leave it, let it be. Okay. Um, that's all I'm going to say. You can think about this if you want. You can ask me later if you want. Um, 
but I'm gonna move on. I'm never gonna talk to you about the RC guns, probably. So, um, what's the last inverse function? And that is gonna include our list of functions is gonna, um, is gonna finish chapter one. We can actually start the course. Logarithms. Um, so what's, um, you know what the logarithm is. I'm just reminding you. Is the inverse of the exponential. So, um, you know, you've known logarithms before anyone told you about logarithms because um, if I ask you to fill in the blanks here, you know how to fill in the blanks. Um, except that you, I don't know how to do this kind of math in your head. So <clears throat> the, the exponential, so when I say exponential, I mean the, the X is in the exponent, not in the base. Otherwise, I would call it the power, even though they're the same thing. Uh, the exponential f of x equals p to the x for p fixed. So, um, so what's the? So we're doing we're doing the thing now. We'll scribble the whole. Scribble the whole page. So that is fixed by closing the program and coming back. And now I hope I can, uh, So what is this question mark? Oh, but oh, oh my gosh, I just wrote it. Uh, but you, you knew you were just being lazy. I was replying. The number you need to take the the number you need to take two to the power of to get eight is three. But more importantly, the operation that you did is you did the logarithm in base two of eight. Uh, here, the question mark is the logarithm on base of base three of one ninth, which is negative two. Here, the question mark is the logarithm in base four of um, of one, and the answer is zero. And if you take instead of two, three, four, you take the number e. The answer is going to be the logarithm in base e of ten, which. Um, Everyone calls the natural logarithm. Mathematicians call it just a logarithm because we don't really think of any other logarithm. Uh, I'm gonna try, I mean, I'm just telling you this because this is what I call the logarithm. I, I hope I don't slip. I really try to call it LN, but if I call it log, you can tell me. Uh, so, if you have a function, um, if you have an exponential function, maybe pi to the x. So how do we find f inverse of x? Um, well, we find f, f inverse by writing y equals f of x. We switch or we don't switch. I think most of you probably we're taught to switch them, so let's switch. Uh, and then you you solve for y. And when you look at this equation, the way you solve for y is you take the logarithm. By definition of the logarithm, this means that 
Um, y is a logarithm in base 5 of x. So f inverse in this case is the logarithm in base 5. So logarithm is the inverse of exponential. Another way of thinking about it is um, if you have a function and it's inverse and you do one and then the other, uh, what happens? Um, so if you do What happens if you do a thing? Um, you take x and you take its exponential, and, th and then you do the inverse. So I take um, maybe I'm going to write a number here. So what is this in words? Um, first, take uh, e, e to the second power and then find which power you need to take of e to get e to the second power. Um, if you if you take some power of e and then you ask what was the exponent, well, it's it's the um, it's the exponent I started with. So the answer is that this is two. You're doing a thing and then you're doing the thing that undoes it. You are left with whatever you started with. Um, you take the logarithm of any number. You get self. This is, this is just true for any function and it's inverse. And for the same reason, you take the, the function that um, you take, you first undo a thing and then you do the thing. What do you get? You get the, you get the function. <clears throat> so um, let's draw the graph and that will be it for today. So, so the exponential, I didn't go through this, I didn't review this, but the exponential is a function that is, is always positive. Um, it, when, when you take a negative exponent, you get very small positive numbers and they get very small very fast over here. And when you take positive exponents, they get very big, very fast. Like in that story where the the guy told the other guy to put a grain of rice in the chessboard and then two of them four. And then he was very arrogant and learned some lesson about something. <clears throat> so that is what the exponential looks like. Uh, so what does the inverse look like, well, we know what it's supposed to look like. It's the, um, it's the reflection across the diagonal mirror. Across the diagonal mirror. So that is the graph of logarithm. Uh, since the exponential only takes positive values, the logarithm can only take a positive input. There's no answer to what the power of two gives me a number negative one as the answer. Um, so I can't really answer the question, what is the logarithm of negative one in base two? Um, since two to the zero is always one, the logarithm of one in is going to be zero. And let's do e to the x. So e to the x is bigger than two. So this function is going to grow faster than two. And it's going to also get smaller faster because one over e is smaller than one over two. 
And the inverse, the natural logarithm is uh, is growing slower. The the logarithm grows so slowly; it's impossible to wrap your mind around it. At least I can't. Um, like, what is the logarithm of the number of atoms in the universe? Um, does anyone know? It's at least a thousand. No, it's a most like 300 and it's probably like 150. So it, you take a huge number, um, like, I mean, that's what I've heard. Actually, I don't know anything about physics, but um, you take the logarithm of the number of atoms in the universe, which looks like something like this, probably, you know, 80 digits. So an immense number that is impossible to think about. And this is something like, I don't know, 150. So logarithms grow so slowly. It's um, insane. All right, that's all I got. Tomorrow we start in chapter two. Tomorrow, I would say we start calculus. You're going to stop recording. You can ask me questions.